It is good to see everyone here tonight, and we're certainly glad that you are able to make it for those who are here. As we look at this week and uh, look at all the things that we are thankful for, and I know people have been making their lists and getting ready and a lot of preparation to get together with families and so forth, it's important, I think, to really uh, put this whole this whole mindset with, uh, you know, we have a holiday, but certainly to be thankful and thinking about all those things into perspective. I think one of the, one of the problems when you look at Israel is that they took God and his blessings for granted. In fact, when you look at a lot of the writings about the Israelites in the Old Testament before captivity, they were warning them to stay faithful to God because of what he was giving them and to be grateful, to be satisfied with what he'd given. Of course, they didn't do that, and so they go into captivity. They spent 70 long years in captivity, and then they come out of it. And years later, Malachi writes about that very same thing, about how the Israelites are just take everything for granted. And so there's a lot of, you know, a lot of this that was going on with, this, uh, with the, the attitude and the characteristic of the Israelites. I mean, look back, and it's easy for us to be very critical of the Israelites. But is it possible that we sometimes do the same thing, and we're sometimes guilty of the same follies that they had with concerning taking God and what he has granted us for granted? Do we assume, just like Israel, that we are God's children, because we're God's children, that that's just enough to secure his goodness, as if we're entitled to something? And that's, I think, a lot of what they had. They, they knew that they were God's chosen. They knew that they were his children. And they felt, that instead of being so grateful and humble about what they were being given, that they felt that they were entitled to it. We need to be very careful that we don't fall under that, that same trap and that same shortcoming with us. I want you to do me a favor if you could tonight, and there's a reason why I'm asking this. I want everyone in here to take out your wallet. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask for money. As you take that out, though, I want you to think about this very carefully. When was the last time that you really thank God that you had something to take out. You think about that. When was the last time that you thank God that you have something, and every one of us do, that you have a home to go to, that you have a refrigerator that has food in it, a pantry that has food, that you're not going hungry? When's the last time you thank God for this house, that these pews that we're able to sit in are soft and we have the walls around us, and the electricity hasn't been shut off. We have a great fellowship hall. You thank God for that lately? Because everything we have in our possession, everything of which we've been blessed, would not even be ours if it wasn't for God. And it doesn't belong to us anyway. It does belong to Him. And when you really look at it, and especially you know, this time of year, I think it is on a lot of people's minds, possibly more than other times of the year. It shouldn't be. It should be something that we think of daily. There are ways in which being thankful strengthens us. I want to take a look at a couple of those tonight and hopefully get our minds focused on where it should be as we start giving thanks this week, as we should every week and every day. Number one, thankfulness strengthens us or strengthens our relationship with others you think about that all of the you know the relationships that we have around us paul was a great example of this and when i you know when i, when I think of people in the bible of you know giving thanks or those who really were sincerely thankful for what they had and those who thankful for the people that had surrounded them paul really is one of those people that come to mind and it's because we do have a lot of his writings of course we're going to probably have more examples than other ones but I want you to take a look at the letters that he wrote to these individuals and just see how much gratitude he had for those who stood righteous with him. And then you think about you know, who is around us. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, and look at how Paul starts. In fact, all of his letters start out in a very similar fashion. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, and you think this is a congregation that he had set up in the midst of a place that was so divisive and they had their issues, certainly. But listen to how Paul recognizes them. 
He says, I thank my God always concerning you. How, you know, what, how humbling and sobering that must have been to get this letter. Think of you, you, know, you be getting this letter from an apostle and someone like Paul. And that is what the very first line out of his letter to them. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. He was grateful for, those, for the members of the Lord's church, those who lifted him up. He was grateful for the work that he was able to do. He was thankful for the fellowship that he had with them. And yes, they needed, you know, you get to verse 10 and you see all the problems of, you know, that had to be corrected. But when you get down to it, Paul was grateful for them. And he says, for the grace of God which is given to you. He was grateful that, of what God was able to afford them. And then you look at Ephesians chapter 1. And beginning in verse 15, something very similar. In fact, I want to look at Ephesians and Colossians, these next couple of chapter, or these next couple of books, these letters, and they're very similar in nature as far as the wording was concerned. We said this morning that Ephesians, his letter to Ephesus and letters to the Colossians are almost, you know, in a lot of ways, they're, uh, they're kind of twin letters. They say a lot of the, they're worded the same, very similar ways to two different groups of people. But in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, Paul states, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord, so he, was, you know, he's, he brings them to mind, and he puts them first, and he's, he's lifting up the, these members of the church. He says, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. And so he recognizes that instantly, doesn't he? He says, I want you to pay attention. Your faith in the, your faith in the Lord, your love for all the saints, for all the people that are around them. Do not cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. Paul was always mindful of the people and how grateful he was to those who, were, who showed the love to the other saints, to the other Christians who were around them, to the ones who showed God the respect that he deserves and having their faith strengthened in God. And he says, I give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And then you take that and you couple it with what he tells the Colossians. You look over at Colossians chapter 1. And the opening four verses give us something very similar. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, so this is a letter being written by Paul and Timothy, and of course they did a lot of work together as we've been studying. From Paul and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. And listen to this and how similar it is to the Ephesians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. How encouraging that must have been to read that. How encouraging and uplifting it must have been to know that an apostle had you in mind. And he says, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. And there it is again, this faith in God, love for all the saints, and he tells them that we, are thank, we give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus for you. And he tells them that we are praying for you constantly. I can't tell you how much your prayers mean to people. I know what they mean to me. I know over the last uh, couple of days, this last week, my wife has received just ample amount of prayers from the congregation I have people coming up to me and asking me just left and right, how is Katie doing? And how encouraging that is to her when she hears that. And I can get to go tell her that just, you know, that this person asked about you and this person asked about you and this person asked about you. And the first, pre, you know, the first thing people say is, uh, well, hi, Nathan, how's your wife? <laughs> but I'm okay with that. Because I know that it makes 
anyone feel good when their church family has them in their prayers? And when you mean that much to someone that you would be the recipients of those prayers and have people ask about you and you receive those cards or those phone calls or those texts, it really does mean something, doesn't it? And how uplifting and edifying it must have been to receive a letter like this from Paul saying, you are in my prayers. And how thankful he was to them for their faith. Telling them, giving them, you know, there's the, I mean, how rewarding that must have been to hear that from the apostle. And then he has his letter to the Philippians in chapter 1. And he expands this. It's not just to the saints. Well, it is to the saints, but he starts to narrow this down and get very specific with it. And he tells them this, this letter as well. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, and look at this, with the bishops and the deacons. So now not only is it just, you know, he, does, he calls out all the saints, but he specifically calls out the leadership and the servants in the congregation, these elders and these deacons. And listen to what he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. He's saying, every, you know, everything, everything that I can remember that you've done, I'm so grateful to the, to the elders, I'm so grateful to the deacons, I'm so grateful to the members in the congregation, always in every prayer of mine. He didn't just pray once and that was one and done. He constantly prayed for them. He kept them in prayer. You know, we have a bulletin every week that comes out and there's prayer requests that, are, that stay in that, don't they? And many people who pray don't just pray once and then forget about it. They, we keep them in prayer. And I hear constantly all these people that are being mentioned in these prayers and how grateful they must be. And here he's telling all the leaders and the members, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. This was part of Paul's prison epistles. And you think of just how hard it must have been to be confined and not be able to leave. And he could have spent his time complaining, could have spent his time trying to reason his case of why he shouldn't be there. But instead, he had the church in his mind. He had the elders and the deacons on his mind and the work that they were doing. He had the members on his mind and their work and the faith that they had, and he was so grateful for it. How humbling that is to see someone that grateful that he would write this. And the Holy Spirit, of course, he's in being inspired by the Holy Spirit when he writes this. But you think of what he was going through and just how from day to day they were the ones thinking on them. They were the ones that got him through it. And you think of what goes on in our lives. First ones we tend to call are members of the church, aren't they? First ones we, have, we tend to call are the leaders asking if they can put the prayer request in asking if they can remember someone in prayer. And there's the deacons right there, ready to go with help. There's Mike Davis, ready to help whoever it is that needs it. How grateful we are in this congregation for our strong leadership. And you see Paul 
and just how rewarding it is to have our faith be strengthened because of the relationships that we have and being thankful for those relationships. You really think about it. Being thankful fortifies our relationships, not just with the leaders, but with our spouses and with our family. Our families are the first ones. They, you know, they hear it all, don't they? Our families are the very first ones in our house, in your own household. When you're in a bad mood and you get cranky or you get tired, and they're the first ones to see it and hear it. But they're also the first ones you go to when there's a problem. A husband will go to his wife. A wife will go to her husband. The children will go to mom and dad. Probably mom more than dad, because mom knows how to fix a lot of problems. But you think of just how thankful we are to our immediate families. And they are able to make us feel in ways that we, that we normally, that no one else can, because they're there. And they listen, and they know us better than, we, than anyone else knows us. Being thankful also fortifies, though, our relationship with our church family. Paul demonstrated that, but going beyond Paul, you think of our church family here and just how everyone has just bonded. Over the last year and a half, we bond over people that we've lost. We bond over things that go really well for us. We bond over the, all the great encouragement that, we, you know, that, that comes in. We get excited together when visitors are here. We get excited when people place membership. We get really excited when there's a baptism. And we go through it all together. And we go through the hard times. But that's our church family. And there's no one that we'd, like, we'd rather lean on when we go through something than our church family. Because we know that someone probably has gone through the same thing when there's, a heart, when there's a heartache. And we ask for prayer and we call our church family. And outside of our immediate family, that is often the strongest relationship that we have with our church family. But thankfulness doesn't just strengthen our relationship with others. It strengthens our relationship with the Lord. And first and foremost, that relationship is by far the most important one that we could ever have. You look back at Psalm 118 and chapter 1 and listen to David's sentiment right here in this. David was one who has wrote you know, many of the Psalms. And if you look, in fact, if you look at a lot of the Psalms, a lot of the Psalms really are of thanksgiving. He, t he tells God, I'm so thankful that you've, that you've saved me from my enemies. I'm thankful that you've gotten me through all of these hard times. I'm thankful that when I had someone chasing me, you're there getting me through it. You look at Psalm 118 and, and verse 1, and he says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. There's not a person in this auditorium tonight that probably doesn't echo that same thought. For his mercy endures forever. And then you look at Revelation chapter 7. This revelation that's given to John, and John gives it to these Christians that are being persecuted at this time. What a scary, horrifying situation that was. What a life they led, not knowing if that was going to be their last day, constantly looking over their shoulder, wondering if, you know, who's going to come in, wondering if, that, you know, if their family, if they're going to ever see their family again. And they're going through all of this turmoil, and John gives them this revelation and to address to the churches of Asia, because there was a lot of persecution among them that was happening in that part of the world, and the, and it was the and the theme of Revelation is one of the most uplifting, encouraging things. In the you know, and you think of it in the in the midst of all of this hurt and pain and fear. There's the theme of Revelation shining through it all. That if you stay faithful to God, it's going to be worth it to you. 
And it was the one driving force with all of these Christians at that time to help them get through whatever it was and not buckle, not to give in, not to compromise, not to renounce Christ. That was what was getting them through the hardest times, knowing God is with me and he's going to stay with me. And there's not a day that goes by that no matter what happens, I'm going to get through it because I know my Christ is right there and he goes through it with me. And he's seen it all and he's with me now. You look at the verse 9 of chapter 7 in Revelation. And here it is. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There's the hope right there. There's the encouragement. There's the, there's the drive. Salvation belongs to, the, belongs to our God who sits on the throne. Salvation belongs to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving. There it is and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The context right here is thankfulness for salvation for those who are in Christ. They weren't just trying to get through the, those times. They were thankful that if that was the last day that they would ever spend, that they could spend eternity with their God. You look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Paul writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. How grateful we are that God sees what we need and he listens when we ask him for it. But we do need to go to God with the right attitude, don't we, when we petition him in prayer? But how often do we thank him for it? Isn't that interesting? It'd be interesting to see the ratio between the two. Because we regularly ask God for favors, don't we? Constantly, we ask him for things. And he wants us to. But what, is, what do you think the ratio is of asking God for all of these different favors and then thanking him for what we already have? How often do we give him thanks? In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, Paul writes, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it, with thanksgiving. Are you thankful to God for your faith? Are you thankful to God? Do you thank him that every time we come in through these doors and every time we sit in these pews and sing praises to him, we have the assurity of knowing with every single song and with every time we take the Lord's Supper that I am saved and I'm grateful to him for that. I am thankful that I am in Christ. I'm thankful that I am on my way to heaven I'm thankful that I have that salvation, that it was given, you know, that, that there was a chance at some point in my life where I could respond to the gospel, that I could go to actually down into that water, that there was a chance for me, Nathan, with all the horrible things that I've done in my past. Christ said, yes. There is a chance for you. And he put his body on the cross to prove it. And there's a chance for you. We need to count our blessings. I think many times we don't even realize how good we have it. 
we start to, you know, we start to build up these, uh, you know, these problems or issues sometimes in our lives, and then we start to embellish them a little bit, and they become stronger and bigger and bigger. And you ever taken a step back and think, you know what? I really do have it better than I could, you know, than I realize. You think about the, you know, I think about when we put the money into the collection plate. It's not just money that's being put in there. Think about why you're doing that. And what, it's, what the scripture says about it, what Paul says about it. Then he says, you put in as you have been prospered. You know what that tells us? By implication, we have something of which we've been prospered. And how thankful we are, or ought to be, that we are able to have that. How grateful we are. We are abundantly blessed. And when you think of not just the, you know, it's not just that we're blessed physically, we're blessed spiritually. Knowing that I, that I can go to heaven knowing that you have access to the only source which offers the way to eternal life. Are you thankful for that? Why not show how thankful you really are and meet the Lord's gospel call? I want to encourage you tonight that if you haven't answered the invitation in a while and you're grateful for what he did, let him know it. Let him know just how thankful you are to have this eternal life. And if there's anything that is keeping you from that relationship with him, I want to encourage you to come forward so we can pray about it and give it up to him as together we stand and sing.